that again, testing one, two. Can you guys hear me? My voice coming through. Amen. All right, if you will, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Looking forward to dealing with the title and topic for our consideration today. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is a pastoral epistle written by the Apostle Paul to a minister named Timothy who has a lot of corrections that he has to make at the church of Ephesus doctrinally and regarding worship and order in the church and so forth. <clears throat> and our focus today will be on prayer. In chapter 2, the context is prayer. It's very important that we get that. The title, if you open your outline at the top, is The Paramount Importance of Public Prayer. The Paramount Public Prayer. Subtitle, Praying to the King for the King. Part 3, we're praying to the King, which is King Jesus, for earthly kings, earthly rulers, earthly um, uh, monarchs and, and the like. Our president, we need to be praying for uh, all of our governmental rulers because they only rule and reign by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that put them there, whether they're good or bad whether you agree with them or not. And 1 Peter 2.17 says that we're to honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God and what? Honor the king, right? So look at chapter 2, verse 1. It starts off with prayer. The whole context of chapter 2 is prayer. He says, I exhort, I urge, I implore, I encourage, therefore, that first of all, <clears throat> supplications and prayers, intercession and giving of thanks be made for who? All men. So the context here, verse 1, that sets the context for us is prayer. God's people are to be given to prayer. If you are a professing Christian, you tell people that you're a Christian. You are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are a, a, a child of Yahweh, the true and the living God. It ought to be manifest by your commitment to prayer. I've said this before, there is no such thing as a non-praying Christian. doesn't exist. It does not exist. And, and not only does he encourage us to pray in verse 1, but he gives us reasons. He gives us reasons. So follow with me. Verse 1, he says, I want you to pray. Verse 2, 3, and 4, he gives us reasons. Here's reason number 1. Well, because verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Pray. We should be given to prayer that God would answer our prayer and keep our government from uh, accosting us and persecuting us and molesting us and, and, and operating in a violent context against the church that would prevent us from being able to come together in, in public worship. Does that make sense? So we want to pray that we can continue to live in peace and live out uh, our lives for the glory of Christ and be able to share the gospel with people without being violently uh, are persecuted and put to death. So reason number one, we want to pray because peace is often the result of us praying to God for that. The second reason is verse three. We ought to be given to prayer because it's good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. See verse three? It's pleasing to God. It's good to God. It's, it's right to God. It pleases God when we pray for people. God loves that. In fact, God prayed in the person of Christ, didn't he? Right. When we think about Christ coming into the world, as you go through the Gospels, what you see is Jesus was committed to prayer. In fact, Luke chapter 6, verse 12 is one verse among many that would underscore the consummate prayer life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was God come to pray. He was committed to prayer. In fact, Luke chapter 6, verse 12 says Jesus prayed all night. Look. And it came to pass in those days that he, Jesus, went out into a, per, into a mountain to pray and continued all night in what? Prayer. Prayer. And Jesus, in Luke 11 and Matthew chapter 6, taught his disciples to what? Pray. Pray. He was committed to prayer. You and I, as followers of Christ, called to be little Christ, if you will, should also be given to prayer because it pleases God. But verse 4 is where we're going to land on right now and spend the rest of our consideration for today. Here's the third reason why you should be given to prayer. Because it says in verse 4 about God's predisposition to be merciful to man. It says, who will have all men to be what? 
saved. So I want you to connect verse 4 with verse 1. We should be a praying people, verse 1, because God is a saving God, verse 4. Y'all get that? So if people are going to be saved, they're going to be saved because we're praying for them. We're praying for them. We covered that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, last week, Paul was confident that the prayers of the believers at the church at Philippi would result in Paul's salvation. That's Philippians 1, 19. And we established that last week. And many of us have seen friends or enemies or loved ones come to Christ because we were committed to prayer. And be encouraged because that normally doesn't happen overnight. You get upset because they, they didn't get saved in 24 hours. So you're ready to stop praying. That's because you're impatient. You're impatient. But those of us that have been given grace by Christ to pray for people, five years, a decade, two decades. Are you ready to pray for people that long? Is their salvation worth it? Yours was, right? You're saved because somebody put up with your hard-headed self. And, and, and pray and say, Lord, give me grace to pray for that knucklehead. And God worked through it and saved you. Right, so you got to be patient. God's patient. In fact, 2 Peter 3.15 says it's the long suffering of God that results in our salvation. Lord, make us patient. Let's go to work. Go to point six on your outline, six Roman numeral five. It's at the top. Here's the point. It says one mediator excludes all human and angelic go-betweens. Does everybody see that point? Let me read verse 5 to you because verse 5 is where that comes from. <clears throat> After verse 4 says that God will have all men to be saved, that means all kinds of men, all classes of men, all sorts of men to be saved, and come unto the knowledge of the truth, that truth is Jesus. Verse 5, for there is one God that's called monotheism. There is only one true and living God. And then it says, and one what? Mediator. So we're to pray for all men, all kinds of men, all classes of men from all over the world, because they've got to meet that one Savior, that one God who is Savior, but they can only get to him through that one go-between, that one mediator between God and men, which is who? The man Christ Jesus. Y'all with me? So let's talk, is it okay if we talk a little bit about that man, that one mediator? One mediator excludes all human and angelic go-between. So write it down. A mediator is a go-between. Is a go-between. In fact, verse 5, it says there's one God and one mediator between. See it? A mediator is one who bridges the gap. A mediator is one that stands between two hostile parties to bring about reconciliation. A mediator is a go-between. Sin has separated between you and your God. That's Isaiah 59, verse 2. Christ came to settle the difference and bring about an atonement, a satisfying sin payment that removes God's anger and hostility and brings about at one mint. That's atonement. Y'all get it? All right. One mediator, therefore, verse 5, one mediator, ready, means you don't need anyone else between you and God. That's what we're going to talk about right now. You and I don't need anyone else between us and God, for there's only one mediator. We don't need anyone else to give us access to God or to make our prayers acceptable to Him. Meaning, very simply, you don't need Jesus plus Anything or anyone else to get to God. All you need is Christ. All you need is Christ. Example number one. You don't need Mary. You don't need Mary. <clears throat> Mary is not a co-mediator. Mary is not a co-intercessor. The Catholic Church has it wrong. We have a trinity. They have a quaternity. Father, Son, Spirit, Mary, that's idolatry. For 1 John 5, 7 says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, that's one. The Word, that's Jesus. And the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Not four. Not four. That means you don't need Mary to get to the Son, to get to the Father. You only need Jesus. To get to God who himself is God in the flesh. So we don't misunderstand what verse 5 is saying. Look at verse 5 again. 
It says, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man. See that there? <clears throat> Verse 5, where it calls Jesus the man, is not denying his deity. Did you guys hear what I said? Where it says, the man there is not denying his deity. Flip to chapter 3. Flip to chapter 3. Look at verse 16. Chapter 3, <clears throat> verse, six, verse 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in what? God was manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus. He came in the person of Christ. So clearly, Paul believes and knows for sure that Jesus is God. Chapter 3, verse 16 says that. All right, now go back to chapter 2. But his humanity is important. We know that because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But I want you to know that Mary is not a mediator. Who is Mary? Our sister. Mary is our sister in Christ, and she is a sinner saved by grace. Right. So I want to get up John chapter two, verse five. We will turn to several passages, but I want you to see this John chapter two, verse five. I want you to see what Mary did. This is at the first recorded miracle in Scripture where Jesus turned the water into wine at Cana of Galilee. Mary knew what her son can do. She's like, hey, 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 son, you know, they need some wine. You know, they had a wine. You, you know, you can fix this. right? You know, you can fix this. Right. And so Jesus gave her a little gentle rebuke. Actually, verse four, Jesus gave her a little sort of gentle rebuke. Verse 4, Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? That, wasn't, that was not a sign of respect. It was common to refer to our sisters as woman in, in that cultural context. But this is a sort of gentle rebuke. What have I to do with thee? My hour has not yet come. In other words, you know what he's saying? Uh, you, you, you're my a biological mother over my human nature, but when it comes to my divine nature, you have no authority in that arena. You are slightly stepping over your bounds. My father will dictate to me when it's time for me to work in the divine realm, not you. Now look at verse 5. You know what she said? His mother said unto the servants, hey, whatever, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Now she got it right. She didn't say whatever I tell you. Hey, whatever he says, go on and do it. He's the Lord, right? Whatever he says to do, do it. And then John, um, Luke chapter 1, if we can get the verse up, verse 47, I want you to see what Mary said. Uh, to her, um, her cousin, John the Baptist's mother. She said, And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my what? She's saying it to Elizabeth. She's calling God her what? That means she is a what? A sinner in need of a what? Mary is not sinless. Mary is not sinless. Mary is not divine. Mary is our sister, a fellow sister, a sinner saved by grace. OK, and look at the next verse. Then she goes on to say here, <clears throat> and I would submit to you that Jesus was her savior. Jesus was her savior. Right. For he has regarded the low of state of his of his handmaiden. She's referring to herself, the lowest state, the uh, humble estate, the based estate, or it can even be translated the vile estate. She's not without sin. She's not without sin. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And she is our blessed sister, isn't she? She was the means and conduit through which Christ came into the world. But she's not to be prayed to. She ain't hearing your prayer. She's wor she worshiping Christ. She's not hearing your prayer. Pray to, pray to God through the Son, not through Mary. Secondly, when we contemplate Christ being our one mediator, that means we don't need to get to God through Mary, nor do we need to get to God through saints. That's why oftentimes, I, didn't, I don't think I did it today, but almost every time we come together, get, we get ready to meet, I always say, good afternoon, saints, huh? So we, we don't get that twisted and think that a saint is some separate a uh, super sinless, holy, set-apart person that, that, that just walks on water that's way better than the rest of us. No, all believers are saints. Did y'all know that? All believers are saints. We don't pray to saints. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, the Catholic Church has got it way wrong here. I want to show you this, and I want to tell you the danger of praying to dead saints. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, <clears throat> Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. And then look at verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, 
to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, set apart in Christ, called to be what? Y'all saw it, right? You see it? Called to be saints. That's all believers. You, you, do you trust Christ? You're a saint. You're a sanctified sinner. You're a set-apart sinner. Yeah? Right? We've been made holy in Christ. Called to be saints with all, that are, uh, with all that in every place. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Right? So we're all saints, number one. That's not some exclusive class uh, that's higher or set apart better than the church, better than the people of God. Moreover, here's the danger in praying to dead saints. Deuteronomy, turn there real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 18 would forbid that, by the way. Deuteronomy chapter 18 would forbid you and I to pray to the dead. And there are people that have talk shows and people that come on TV and they purport to be able to communicate with your dead relatives. And you tell me what to say and I'll communicate it to them. And then they supposedly communicate to them and your great-great-grandmother told me to tell you this. Okay? The Old Testament forbid that. If you're in Deuteronomy chapter 18... At verse 10, it says, um, verse 9, When you are coming to the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of the nations. Those are the Canaanites. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That's child sacrifice. They would offer their children up, burn their children up in the fire, offering them to that Old Testament false god, that idol called Moloch. And others. He, he says, the heathen do this, the Canaanites do it, don't you do it. Don't, don't cause your children to pass through the fire. <clears throat> or that uses divination or an observer of time. Divination, that would be a form of witchcraft or observer of times. What's that talking about? Fortune tellers. Do not engage with fortune tellers. I've said this before. You skip over that page in the newspaper if you still get the news, newspaper. You are not to have anything to do with fortune-telling and astrology and signs, Sagittarius and Libra. No, you're a Christian. You're a Christian. That is witchcraft. You're not to have anything to do with it. Your sign is Jesus. That's your sign now. That's your sign. An observer of times or an enchanter. These are those that use enchantment to, to try to discover secrets, if you will. Or a witch, that's a sorcerer. Or a charmer, do you see that there? Charmer is one that uh, claims to have the power to subdue men or animals, to kind of spellbound people, if you will. You are never to let anyone do that to you. Or a consulter of evil, sp or familiar spirits, that would be communicating with spirits. Or a wizard, that's a, spirit a spiritist. Or a what? Necromancer, that's the word. Praying to dead saints is practicing necromancing. Necromancing, forbidden by God in the Old Testament, <clears throat> was the practice of what I just said a minute ago, uh, of trying to communicate with the dead. You remember the witch at Endor? 1 Samuel chapter 8. And just before God killed Saul and took him out in a sort of fit of desperation, he went against God's explicitly given word in the scriptures. And he went by night and covered himself and went to see a witch. And the witch claimed to be speaking for Samuel. I won't take you there for time's sake because I got a lot, of sh lot to show you. But 1 Samuel chapter 28, it was not Samuel talking to Saul. It was Satan through the romancing you and i are to have nothing to do with that at all nothing to do with it at all well praying to dead saints as is often the case in catholicism is the practice of necromancing thusly i e witchcraft forbidden in scripture hopefully that rings home we don't need to pray through saints or to dead saints to get to god we get to god through the lord jesus christ here's a third category we don't pray to angels we don't pray to angels go to hebrews chapter 2 flip to hebrews chapter two. we don't pray to angels know this know this that the qualification for a redeemer to redeem us is he could not take upon himself the form of an angel did y'all know that you're going to know it now hebrews chapter 2 if you've never heard this before look at uh, verse 16 everybody there 
Hebrews 2.16, it says, For verily he, that's Jesus, when he came into the world, took not on him the nature of who? Angels. Angels can't save. Angels can't redeem. Angels can't mediate. They are servants and ministers of God's elect. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. But angels are not mediators or go-betweens. Only Christ is. He took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became a real man in flesh and blood. We, uh, when we come to God through Christ, we're coming to a real man, the God man, the only one that's able to make access for you and I to God. Amen? A perfect God man. Here's the other reason you may not know this. Go to Job 4. Job chapter 4. Please turn there. I want you to know the other reason why we don't ever, 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 pray to angels. Job chapter 4. I hope you are making your way there. Job 4. These are Job's uh, messed up friends, miserable counselors they were. And if you're in Job chapter 4, I want you to see what Eliphaz had to say to Job because Eliphaz and Job's friends thought Job got a little bit too big for his britches. Because he was complaining about his suffering, and they thought that he was bringing indictment on God. And they said in verse 17, Job 4, 17, Shall shall mortal man, you Job, be more just than God? Do you see that? And they thought that Job was trying to be more just or acting as if he was more just than God because he was calling God into question for what he was doing to Job. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? What's the answer? Of course not. That's true. It's good theology. Bad application because Job wasn't doing that. But look at verse 18. Not in the fullest extent. Job had some fault. But look at verse 18. Behold, he, that's God, puts no trust in his what? You can write next to that. Angels. The word servants here in verse 18 in its context is referring to angels. God puts no trust in his angels and his what? Angels, see it? And his angels, he charged with what? Folly or error. You know what that means? Angels are not perfect. You know, when people say, well, you know, I'm I'm pretty good. I'm no angel. That's not saying much, (laughs) right? Now, angels are good. the, The elect angels are holy and righteous, but they're not perfect. Only Christ is perfect. Don't make angels the standard. Make Jesus the standard. You following me? So, do we ever have a place in, uh, in Scripture, a historical account, where angels fell into folly and error? Of course, a third of the angels fell. Revelation chapter 12 tells us that, right? Two-thirds of the angels didn't fall. How come? Simply because they were kept. Simply because they were kept. If God took his hands off the angels, the rest of them would fall too. They're kept by the grace of God, just like you and I are only kept. By the grace of God. Amen. That ought to make you very humble. You don't keep yourself. Christ keeps you. Flip to chapter 15. Job. Chapter 15. Angels are not perfect. Angels are kept. Can can you put that verse back up there? Job, I want, uh, uh, there was something else I want you to see. As you guys turn to chapter 15, Job 15, there's one more word I wanted you to see up there. You're in Job 15. Watch what it said here again. <clears throat> Behold, he, God, puts no what? Neither should you. God puts no trust in his servants, i.e. his angels. He didn't put his trust in his angels. If God doesn't put his trust in his angels, why should you? Do you see it? God put his trust in Christ. Did you know that? God put his trust in Christ? Did, did you know that God trusted Christ by placing everything? Matthew 28, 18, he placed everything in Jesus' hands. He never did that to an angel. But he did to his darling son, the God-man. Matthew 28, Jesus said, all power, all exousia, all authority has been given unto me. He never said that about angels. If you're in chapter 15, Chapter 15, go, yeah, verse 14. Eliphaz says, <clears throat> what is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. Uh, we're, all, we're all born of a woman. All of us come into the world sinners, is what he's saying. Behold, he, God, puts no trust 
in his saints, yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Whoa. How infinitely holy is God if even the very heavens in comparison to God are unclean? See how bad we need a mediator? We need a holy, holy, holy mediator to be accepted with God. That's that holy. That's some serious holiness, isn't it? Now, when we talk about one mediator, here's another one. Not Mary, not saints, not angels. Here's another one. Not the Pope. Not the Pope. The Pope is not a go-between as you turn to Matthew 23, so I can tether this with Scripture. Matthew chapter 23. Don't you ever pray to the Pope. Don't you ever put your confidence in I wouldn't even pay attention to what he's saying. I don't even pay him any mind. He comes on TV, change the channel. That knucklehead. Pope in the Latin means Papa. 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 Father. Jesus was very serious about this in regards to who we should call Father. And he says in Matthew, yeah, here it is, Matthew chapter 23, look at verse 8. Jesus says, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ and all ye are brethren. Doesn't mean that God doesn't give us human teachers because he does, but our ultimate teacher is who? God. They shall be all taught of God. John 6, 45. Look at verse 9. And call no man your what? There you go. Don't call any man pope. Don't you call any man pope. It doesn't mean we don't have earthly biological fathers. It doesn't mean that. But to call a man um, a a father in this context is to give him supreme authority. Papa in this context is one who has supreme authority, one who gives life. There's only one life giver, the true and living God. Does that make sense? There's only one that has authority, only one that gives life. And God alone is the source of life and truth. Let me say it again. God alone is the source of life and truth. Not a man. Not a man. So the Pope, taking that title upon himself, is blaspheming and making himself an enemy of Christ. We only have one Father, and it's in heaven. Our Father, which art where? In heaven. That's Matthew chapter 6. Two more. When we pray to God... We come as you go to Hebrews chapter 7, please. Hebrews chapter 7. We don't come to God through anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ, which means we don't need an earthly or human priest. Catholic Church messing up there too, huh? We don't need an earthly priest. Don't you ever call a man a priest. Ever. There's only one true ultimate priest. And I want you to see here in Hebrews chapter 7, that man is Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 7, look at verse 23. Referring to verse 23 is referring to the Aaronic Levitical priesthood, which was imperfect and it was only typical of one that would come that would be greater. Verse 23, it says, And they truly were many priests under the Old Testament because they were not suffered to continue by reason of what? Right, so they would have the priesthood for a little while, they would die, then they would be replaced, and they would do it for a little while and die and be replaced. They were never the reality, they were only a picture of the reality, a figure of the reality, okay? Verse 24 is the reality. Verse 24, but this man, because he continues how long, folks? He continues how long, folks? And he has what kind of priesthood? Un changeable and inviolable is what it means a permanent one that don't ever 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 pass away that's what that greek word there means forever that means you ain't no priest unless somehow jesus can perish and if jesus ever well look at let's watch what it says verse 25 wherefore he jesus is able also to save them to the uttermost only christ can do that To save to the uttermost, that means fully, say fully, and say finally. All those that come unto God by him, watch this, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. See it? So if his priesthood don't ever, ever end, how are you a priest? Right? If his priesthood don't ever, ever end, how are you a priest? Did you replace Jesus somehow? 
You follow what I'm saying? Blasphemy. Only Christ. Last one. Last one. One mediator means your pastor is not the mediator. That means I'm not the mediator. This is why we don't ever have people walk up here to the front of the church. We don't ever have a church aisle hour. Because it, number one, it's not biblical. Okay, the altar, Christ is the altar. Read Hebrews 12 in your own time. Christ is the altar. It's just a piece of wood. Okay? And we don't have people come to the front of the church because it gives the wrong impression as if somehow, some way, in order to get to God, you've got to come through the, 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 the man of God. The, the man of God that, 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 that floats and his uh, feet don't touch the ground. He's so holy. You can come to God through him. That's crazy. That's crazy. I'm not the go-between. I'm just a messenger and a minister sent to serve and sent to preach the truth to you. That's all. That's all. The pastor is not the go-between. He's not the mediator. I can pray for you. Listen to me. Listen to me. I can pray for you, but I can't atone for you. Does that make sense? I can pray for you. You come out, if you guys would ever come out on Tuesday, you would see we pray for you. We pray for you, but I can't atone for you. Listen to this. I can pray for you. I can pray for you, but I cannot pray for you. Somebody got that. So there are times where we, we're in a mess, we're in a pit, and we need a brother or sister to pray for us. I'm cool with that. I understand that. We all get in those phases, but that should not be the typical sort of modus operandi where you don't pray to God. You're always asking someone else to pray for you. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Why don't you come pray for yourself? Why don't you come pray for yourself? Does that make sense? You ought to pray for yourself. Very important. I can't pray for you if you get it. Two things. I'm going to move on. Number one, you must pray for yourself. That's 1 Timothy 2, uh, uh, verse 1. We're told to pray and pray without ceasing, privately and publicly. And number two, Christ must pray for you. John 17, 9. John 17, 9. Jesus said, I pray for them. High priestly prayer. Only reason you're saved is because Christ prayed for you. Amen. Christ prayed for you. He's the one you really need praying for you. The one mediator between God and men, right? I pray for them. Then he goes on, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine and thine are mine. The elect all over the world, those are the ones that Christ prays for. We don't know who they are, so we pray for all kinds, all classes, all sorts of men, and God will save whom he's pleased to save. Amen. Go back to 1 Timothy 2. Just keep it moving. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Point number seven, I want to talk about this ransom. I want to talk about this ransom. The idea of a ransom is really awesome. Uh, Point number seven, the nature and impact of the ransom. Okay, look at verse six. It says that Jesus, verse six, who, 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself a what? Ransom for all to be testified in due time. All right, y'all ready to go to work on this one? We got to go to work. All right. See the word all in verse six. The word all in verse six is the same all back in verse two. Look at verse two. Uh, We're to be praying for all men, for kings and for what? All that are in authority. So the context, the immediate context is the all is referring to kings, rulers, authorities, magistrates, people that are in positions of power. Okay. so this makes the all mean ready all without distinction, but not all without qualification. Are you with me so far? All without distinction, all kinds, all sorts, all classes, but not all without any sort of qualification at all. I'll explain what I mean by that. So all therefore means all kinds, all sorts, all all classes, all ranks of people, high and low, Jew and Gentile, uh, ruler and slave. Can I show you? Go to chapter 6. Stay in 1 Timothy. Flip with me to chapter 6. Chapter 6, what you'll see is that God saves people from every socioeconomic group, if you will, okay? Look at verse 1. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. Paul says, let as many what? Servants. 
or slaves. These were, or many of these were indentured servants in the Roman Empire in the first century, and God was saving them, saving them. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believed in what? Oh, so verse 1 uh, underscores believing servants. Verse 2 underscores believing masters because God saves from both classes. See it? He saves from both classes. <clears throat> and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brothers. See it? They're brethren. But rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved. Partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. See that? So as you turn back to chapter 2, Slavery in the first century in the Roman Empire was so big and so pervasive that almost two out of every three people that you passed on the street was a slave. But guess what brought an end to Roman slavery? Not boycotting, not picketing, not blowing up buildings, not fighting politically, praying, loving lost souls, and preaching the gospel. And the gospel ultimately brought slavery to an end in the Roman Empire. Isn't that wonderful? That's the power of the gospel. But it wasn't by fighting and uh, boycotting and picketing and protesting in the streets. That'll never do it. That's not God's way. That's not God's way. All right, let's talk a little bit more as we go back to our text. Um, <clears throat> oh, and verse 7. 1 Timothy 2, please, back to our home text. So what I want you to see is the all in verse 1, and the all in verse 2 means all kinds of men. Look at verse 4. Who will have all men? See it? He keeps saying all, 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 right? But he's already qualified it by kings and those that are in authority. That would be a surprise because there were not many kings and rulers that were saved and brought into the faith, but there were some. There were some. They're not outside of God's reach, are they? They're not outside of God's reach. So verse 4, he will have all men to be saved. That means all kinds of men, all classes of men. And then look at verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the who? Gentiles. So that immediate context gives more understanding of what he means by all men. All kinds of men, Jew and Gentile, high and low, rich and poor. You guys getting it so far? This is important to understanding the extent of the ransom atonement in verse 6. Everybody with me? Now let's deal with verse 6. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. This is the first thing I want you to get from verse 6. Ready? He shall not fail. Y'all get that? That's the first thing I want you to get out of verse 6. He, Jesus, shall not fail. What do you mean? What I mean is Christ laying down his life as a ransom for all is not referring to universe, universalism. It's not teaching universalism at all. What do you mean by universalism? Verse 6 of 1 Timothy 2 is not saying, you got to think with me now, ready, that Jesus, when he died on Calvary Street, laid down his life as a ransom for every single person in the world. That's not what the verse is saying. How do we know that? Because if he did, it would make Jesus a failure. Some of you got that, right? Here's the question. How would that make Jesus a failure if he died for every single individual? If all there means every person per capita. And I won't take you to the verses now, but we did a study on all and all. And the world, and we saw in multiple contexts, multiple contexts, that all and the world or the whole world in many places does not mean every single individual per capita. It means all kinds, all classes, Jew and Gentile. So here's the problem. Put up Isaiah chapter 42, verse 4. If Jesus died for every single person in the world and laid down his life as a universal ransom atonement, that would make him a failure. It would make him a failure because that would mean that some people that Jesus died for still went to hell. You following the logic? It, it, in fact, if one person that Jesus died for still goes to hell, that makes Jesus a failure for that person. How was that? Didn't Jesus, didn't, didn't Matthew 121 say, listen, listen, and they shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their what? From their sins. 
from their sins. If they still go to hell for their sins, but he died for their sins, that means he, he, he dropped some of them. He missed some of them. He failed to atone for some of them. You follow what I'm saying? And that's not possible. That's not possible. Isaiah 42, 4, he shall not fail. He shall not fail. It was impossible for Christ to fail. So he could not have died for anybody that ends up in hell. If they're in hell, they're in hell because they wanted to be there. They're in hell because the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is what? Nobody goes to hell because they weren't chosen. That's not why you go to hell. You don't go to hell because you're not elect. You go to hell because you sin. You sin and you refuse to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All, therefore, that hate me, love death. That's Proverbs 8.36. Proverbs 8.36. So, so, ooh, go to Psalms 135. Psalms 135. I want you to see this. The God of the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thrice holy, thrice powerful, all omnipotent, is totally sovereign over all things, comprehensively sovereign over all things. You know what that means? He always gets what he wants. He always get, gets what he wants every single time. He's not like you and me. We don't always get what we want and we get frustrated, don't we? God's never, he ain't never frustrated at all. Never frustrated. He always gets his way. You in Psalms 135? Psalms 135, verse 6. We call this the sovereignty of God. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he. See it? Whatever he wanted to do, he did it. See, whatsoever he pleased, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven, in earth, in the seas, in all deep places. He gets what he wants all the time, everywhere. You see it? Do you guys believe that? Go to Psalms 115. That means Jesus ain't trying to save people and people slipping between his fingers going to hell. Psalms 115. Everybody there? Verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3, it says, but our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. See it? It means what it says. Whatsoever he has pleased. I want to get up Daniel 4.35. Daniel 4.35, this is another one that would go in the same category of what we're talking about. Watch what uh, it says here. Daniel said, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. In comparison to God, nothing. In comparison to God, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. Can nobody stop him or say unto him, what are you doing? Nobody can do that. Do you see it? So he can't fail. I think we've driven that point home. It's impossible for God to fail. He has all power. Those are the omnis. Those are the omnis. Let's, let's take it a step further, okay? Now, I want you to go back to our text. No, in fact, go to Matthew 20. If that's not compelling enough, this is even more compelling. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 20. And while you're turning, while you are turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, I want to get our home text back up. 1 Timothy 2.6. I want to compare Scripture with Scripture. What we're getting ready to do now is called the analogy of faith. What we're getting ready <clears throat> to do now is called the analogy of faith. We're letting Scripture explain Scripture, okay? So it ain't just the pastor telling us how he feels, right? Scripture. All right, so 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. Look at it again, our home text. It says, in, in reference to Christ, he gave himself a ransom for who? All. This is what I submit to you, that the all there means all kinds, all classes. That all is huge. It's huge. But it's not infinite in its number. It's large. It's gargantuan. It's like the stars in the sky. But it does have a definite number to it. I would submit to you that the all there can be understood as many. Many. And I'm going to prove it to you with Scripture, okay? Leave that there. Everybody in Matthew 20? We're just going to let God's word speak. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 20. Watch what Jesus says. Go down to uh, verse 26. Jesus said in verse 26, but it shall not be so among you um, in, in regards to the ministry of the apostles. They were to operate in humility, not in uh, heathen Gentile pride. 
He goes on to say, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Let him be your servant. And whosoever will be the chief among you, let him be your what? Servant. So advancing in the kingdom of God is different than the world. Advancing in the kingdom of God is this way. It's down. You want to become great in the kingdom of God? Go down. John the Baptist said in John 3.30, Jesus must what? And I must what? That's, that's the key to being great is going down. You got to become a nothing before you can become a someone. Before honor is what? Humility. Proverbs 15, 33. All right, y'all ready for this? Look at verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came. Who is that? And who's talking here? Right. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give his life a what? Oh, that's the same word in our text. Jesus is going to shed light on a ransom. But to minister and to give his life a ransom for who? Now, who said that? That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. Now, flip to chapter 26, Matthew 26. In Jesus' own words. Who knows the ransom better than the ransomer? You guys in Matthew chapter 26? Now, watch what Jesus says at this uh, Last Supper, verse 26. 26, 26. It says, and as they were eating, uh, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. It was symbolic of his body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Okay? That wine was symbolic of the blood that Jesus was shed, and when he shed it, he put away the old covenant and established the new covenant, okay? And watch what he says. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for who? Many. Many. For the remission of sins. Jesus is more qualified than anyone else to explain to us the extent of the ransom atonement. And Jesus' interpretation out of his own mouth is that that ransom is for many. These are Jesus' own words describing the application of his own atonement. He describes it as many. Don't argue with Jesus. Don't argue with Jesus. We don't make the extent of it bigger, but we also don't make it smaller. We just say what the Word says, right? We just say what the the Word says. We bless God as huge because we're huge sinners. We're huge sinners, but we are to be very careful to frame our words right where we don't blaspheme and somehow articulate the gospel in such a way as to make Jesus a failure because he's not. Here's the other part I want you to see. Go back to our text. This is beautiful. you got to see this. If you go back to 1 Timothy 6, I want you to see something that you probably didn't notice. Uh, Okay, if you're in 1 Timothy 2, 6, look at the text. It says, who gave himself a ransom for all, right? He gave himself. It underscores the volitional aspect of the ransom. The volitional aspect. And, and, and so it's of Jesus' own blessed volition and will that he came and laid down his life, okay? So here's my question for you today. Ready? We ready? Who slew Jesus? Who slew Jesus? Got a couple of questions for you. Number one. Was it the Jews? Was it the Jews that slew Jesus? Acts chapter 5, verse 30. Yes. Yes. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. I'm going to several verses, okay? The preacher here says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew, and hanged on a tree. In that context, they're talking to Jewish people. Second question. Was it the Romans that slew Jesus? Yes, Matthew chapter 20, verse 19. Jesus himself said it. 
and uh, uh, prophesying his death, he said, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and discourage and to crucify him. Third question. Who slew Christ? Was it us sinners? Yes. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Ooh, a lot of guilt, huh? A lot of guilt. Paul says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. It was my sins and your sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. But God is so good, all you got to do is confess it. All you got to do is confess it. All you got to do is repent. Sin is washed away forever. It's washed away, but you got to confess it. Proud sinner. Who slew Christ? Was it God? Yes. Isaiah 53, 10. It was God the Father. Ultimately, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to crush him on that cross as an offering for our sins. The Father did it. Yet, it's true the Jews did it. It's true the Romans did it. It's true that we sinners did it. It's true that God did it. Yet, no man took his life. He swore to his own hurt. That's Psalms 15, 4. He swore to his own hurt, and he gave up his own life. That's Galatians 1, 4. He gave up his own life. And he also said in another place, no man takes my life from me. No man takes my life from me. This is John 10, 17 and 18. No man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. That's a bad man. That's a bad man. That's a bad man. Watch what it says in Galatians 1, 4. Who, referring to Christ, gave himself for our sins. See it? That he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. He gave himself. He gave his own life, didn't he? He gave his own life. What was it that caused Jesus to lay it down? Love. Love laid it down. That'd be a good song, huh? We have to put some words together. Love laid it down. That's that's 1 John 3.16, by the way. 1 John 3.16. Hereby perceive we the love of God that he laid down his life for us. Therefore, we ought to also lay down our lives for the brethren. That's scripture. But I want you to see this. Verse 6. Ready? 1 Timothy 2.6. Who gave himself as a what? This is not the normal Greek word for ransom. The normal Greek word for ransom is lutron. We've talked about that, right? We do the lutron dance now because Jesus saved us, right? And, and the Greek word lutron is where it translated the word ransom. The ransom is a purchase price that sets free or manumits a slave. Does that make sense? It's the payment that sets a free, uh, free a slave, manumits a slave. But the word here is not merely lutron. It's anti-lutron. Anti-lutron. An anti-lutron, the word anti there refers to an exchange. An exchange. So where it says that, in verse 6, who gave himself an anti-lutron. He gave himself an exchange. The word anti there means in exchange. He gave himself in the stead or in the place this is vicarious substitution gave himself in our place and in our stead himself being the payment take me in bonds and let them go their way you get it now that's what he did that's some serious love isn't it you know what we call that first peter three eighteen. the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but quickened in the spirit, quickened in the spirit. Had he not been willing to take our place as hellbound sinners, you and I never, ever, ever would have went free. The ransom is a person. Don't ever forget that. Gave himself in exchange for sinners. Point number eight, quickly, go back to our text. Christ, the true witness and testifier of the saving nature of God, okay? In verse six, I want you to see something else. It says that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all to be testified. See that there? To be testified in time. Or he gave himself a ransom for all the testimony in its own times. 
the testimony in its own times. That's literally how it is um, in the Greek. Not to be testified, but the testimony in its own times. So verse 6 is really referring to the testimony of the ransom. Did you know that the ransom was a testimony? Have you ever considered the ransom actually being a testimony? So the question is, well, what did the ransom testify to? Verse 6, he gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified or as the testimony in its own times, in the proper times or the due times, the, the, at the God-appointed time, Christ came and offered himself as a ransom in order to give a testimony. We don't have to guess what the testimony is. We read this in its immediate context. So if you go back, you can see um, verse 3. Ready? The ransom of Christ in verse 6 testified to some things. Number one, verse 3. Well, verse 3 is said that this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Our what? Savior. The ransom testified to the fact that God's a Savior. He's a Savior. And the ransom testified to, look at verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved? What's the testimony of the ransom? That God is propitious, that God is willing, that God is inclined to save all kinds of men. He's already done what was necessary to save those men. So when the gospel comes to you, the gospel doesn't say, if you do this, that, and the other thing, you can be right with God. What it says is, no, God has already done this, that, and the other thing through the crucified Christ. Just believe it. Just believe it. God's already done it. He's already done it through the sufferings of Christ and his shed blood. So I want you to notice something here. You, you may not have ever thought about Jesus this way. Jesus, in a sense, is an apostle. Did y'all know that? Jesus, in a sense, is an apostle. So we're going to look at two verses. I want you to go to John chapter 18. Turn with me to John 18. And while you're turning to... On 18, I want to get Hebrews 3, 1 up on the overhead. In fact, I would submit to you that Jesus is the first apostle. <coughs> first apostle. In the ultimate sense. Everybody in John 18? And we're contemplating Jesus bearing testimony by his ransom. Okay? Now, if you guys are in John 18... And you look on the overhead here real quick. Watch what it says. <clears throat> and it says, in, in reference to Christ, we made a comparison between Moses and the Lord Jesus Christ here. Um, and it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the what? Apostle and high priest of our profession. What's his name? See it? First apostle. An apostle is a delegate, is a messenger, one sent on the behalf of the other, vested with the authority of that other person to deliver a message on their behalf. Well, who sent Jesus into the world? God the Father, right? God the Father. And Christ came and bore record. In fact, he says in John chapter 18, this is that great witness that he made before Pontius Pilate. And First Timothy refers to this, and we'll get to it. When we get there, but if you're in uh, John 18, Jesus in verse 36, <clears throat> Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Y'all see that there? This is why we don't we don't engage in physical fights and confrontations to try to physically take over the government. Christ didn't come to set up a political kingdom here. His kingdom is not of this world. And we are not of this world. We're passing through. This is why we're not to get too wrapped up in politics. You are not a Democrat. You're not a Republican. You're a Christian. Stop going by that. That's not your name. And at Antioch, Acts 11 says, and they were first called Christian. It doesn't say Democrat or Republican. They were first called Republican. Isn't that something? First called Democrat. First called Christian. That's your lording identity. He goes on to say, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, then we would throw down. You see it? Hey, he is a man of war, right? 
Hey, it, Jesus said, if, the, if my kingdom was of this world, we would tear it up. We would tear it up. If my kingdom was of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Now, if Hence, that's why he ain't going to Israel to set up a political theocratic system in Palestine. His kingdom is not of this world. Verse 37, Pilate therefore sent unto him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. In other words, he answered in the affirmative. And he affirmed what he said, that it was true, that he is a king. And then he said, to this end was I born. Here it is. For this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the what? Ah, he came to bear witness. That makes Jesus a what? A testifier. He came to bear record to and to testify unto the truth. And everyone that's of the truth hears my voice. That's how you know you're of the truth. You hear his voice and you believe him and you believe his gospel. You don't fight against God's word. Say that don't sound, that don't sound right to me. I believe something else that don't make sense to me. You're not of the truth if you talk like that. Right? You're not of the truth. It's very simple. So, therefore, Jesus then is the one that came to give the testimony. The word here, witness, and the word in our text in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, witness, is where we get the English word martyr. Martyr. A martyr is an ear witness and an eyewitness of the things that he or she has seen and heard and is willing and ready to bear record to it even unto death. Jesus is the great witness then, isn't he? Didn't he be a record even unto the death? Isn't that the ransom? So you can write it down then. The testimony, as you flip to chapter 20, let me hurry up because we're starting to run out of time. As you flip to chapter 20, the testimony that Christ gave was through the life that he lived, the teaching that he inculcated, the preaching that he proclaimed, the love that he demonstrated, and ultimately death that he laid down on Calvary, atoning for the sins of his people from every 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 tribe, tongue, and nation, and the subsequent resurrection. All of those things testify to the glorious character and nature and attributes of the true and the living God. Thusly, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? There's the testimony. This is why he's called the truth. Why is he called the truth? He said the verse. But why is Jesus the way and the truth and the life? Well, there's only life in him, and he's the only way to the Father. But he's the truth because he is the true and accurate revelation of the invisible God. You get it? Everything he did and said in his in life. In his record to that. John chapter 20. I won't get to half the stuff I thought I was going to get to. But look at John 20, 20. Let me hurry up. It says, when he had so said, he showed unto them to the disciples his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. This is after the resurrection. Jesus showed himself to the disciples. He was seen of his people for over 40 days. Over 40 days. Don't tell me he didn't raise again. 40 days. Now, look at the next verse. And, when they, and they were glad when they saw the Lord. In verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, apostle, even so I send you, apostles. You guys get it? Just as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. And you and I are sent too. He's talking to you. And everywhere we go, we are to be eager, willing, ready to communicate the gospel to a lost world. Are you ready to do that? It's what we're called to do. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that lies within you with meekness and with fear. 1 Peter 3.15, that's your marching orders, 1 Peter 3.15. As we conclude, what is it that Jesus, let's go back and wrap it up. Oh, wait till we get to point nine. We can't get there today, but uh, Lord willing. All right, as, as we wrap this up, what was it? Let's finish right here, verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified testified in due time. What was it that Christ testified regarding his father? Number one, he testified that God is propitious. God is propitious. He's ready to save. He's ready to pardon. He's, he, he's slow to anger. 
He's slow to wrath. He's ready to have mercy on those that receive and believe on his son. Ready to do it. Ready to do it. Favorably disposed to man. What else did Christ by his vicarious substitutionary atonement and ransom on the cross? What else did he testify to? That God is ready to forgive, but on his terms. On his own terms. You've got to come to him through his terms. By the terms of the gospel, you've got to receive the gospel. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to come to Christ in faith. It's got to be on his terms. Number three, Jesus' ransom death on the cross showed it. Listen, God is not a respecter of persons. He don't care what you look like. He don't care what you look like. He don't care what color you are. He doesn't care what part of the world you come from. Look at verse four. Who will have all men to be saved? See it? All kinds, all classes. God is not a respecter of persons. That's Acts 10, 34 and 35. What else does the ransom testify to? Ready? That God has a sufficient solution for man's sin. He's got a sufficient solution for man's sin and death and hell problem. Did you know there's no other religious system out there that can solve our sin problem? That can solve our death problem? That can solve our hell problem? But the ransom of Jesus Christ? That's the only solution. And it works every time. It works every time. The other thing that the ransom reveals to us via the testimony of Jesus is that God is very, 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 very patient and long-suffering. Very patient, but you better turn because he ain't waiting forever. He's not waiting. There is a time when you will call on the Lord and he will not hear you. Proverbs chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 11 and other places. Very clear, very clear. What else does Christ's ransom show? God is willing to be reconciled to you. He's already done the work of reconciliation. He just says, receive Christ, believe Christ, believe the gospel, and the work's done. You're good to go. Isn't that good? You're good to go. You're good to go. Lastly, Jesus' death is the only remission for sins. There is no other payment. There is no other ransom that can deal with our sin problem. Otherwise, Christ wouldn't have killed his own or God wouldn't have killed his own son on the cross. Think about it. I'm done here. If there was another way, listen, if there was another way you think God would have killed his son. Do you think that God would have killed his son to just make it possible for people to to be? I don't think God would do that. I think God's a lot wiser than that. God knew that if I'm going to offer up my only son, my only begotten son, it's going to be successful. There's going to be no possibility of failing. And when I'm done, all the work is going to be done. I, I'm not going to leave one thing for my knucklehead children to do. Because if, if I leave one thing up to them, it ain't going to get done. I'm thankful he didn't leave anything for me or you to do. He's already done it all. Trust in his son and you're good to go. Amen. Amen.